Hallo und guten Abend. Welcome to the OIIP, the Austrian Institute for International Affairs. As a scientific director, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecture, uh, Governing Global Health Security in the 21st Century, and to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Stefan Elbert of the University of Sussex, who will be introduced properly in a minute. This year, the OIIP celebrates 40 years of tirelessly working at the intersections of academic research, policy consultancy, and public engagement. Uh, and this event is part of our celebrations and of our efforts to bring the really big questions of international politics to the fore. Um, and all of these big issues cannot be limited anymore to different policy fields or different sections within a political science department. There is virtually no political issue that does not intimately link the local and the global. So we cannot reduce understandings of the global to what is done within an international <laughs> relations department. Um, this is why we don't only have focal areas in international security, local specializations in the MENA region, the Western Balkans, Turkey, work on political violence and extremism, gender and security, but also our very own research area dedicated to the global politics of innovation. And um, this is an area that talks about the links between technology, innovation, politics, and specifically and importantly focuses on global health. And this um, area is headed by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Christian Haddad, uh, who will also introduce our guest who organized tonight's event. So thank you, Christian, for this. Um, thank you also to our cooperation partners for this event that is the Horizon 2020 project Inside Inventing a Shared Science Diplomacy for Europe, which is partly conducted at the University of Vienna and represented by Dr. Katharina Paul. Um, and also thank you to the cooperation partner for the event series, that is the Austrian Ministry for Science, oh, for science, no, for defense. If I see anyone here, so please forgive me. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to the keynote and to the discussion. And um, Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello from my side. My name is Christian Haddad. I work here also at the department. And it's my pleasure to chair this um, keynote um, tonight. Uh, before I hand over uh, the imaginary microphone to Stefan Elbe, let me say a couple of more words on this research area, the global politics of science, technology, and innovation that I work on, which is one of the five main um, research areas we have here at the department. So it's innovation, this dazzling, promissory concept, uh, somehow elusive, that has m mobilized so many governments, corporations, and also individuals worldwide. And this notion that is also linked to this idea of a good society, or perhaps e even say a better society that is um, realizable or attainable through technological pro um, progress and innovation. And in our work here at the Institute, we um, are looking into different topical sites where this nexus between innovation and politics is uh, materializes and um, where innovation becomes an object of debate, of cont contestation, or if we perhaps stay in the terminology of our discipline, where it becomes an object of societal power struggles. And the topic we I have tonight, Global Health Security, is definitely one of these sites where um, also technology and societal problems and the politics that revolve around it come together in a very interesting um, conjunction. And therefore I'm very delighted to introduce to you our guest to tonight, um, um, Professor Stefan Elbe. He's um, Director of International Relations and the director of the Center for Global Health Policy at the University of Sussex. His research interests and expertise span a wide range of um, topics that revolve around this nexus between health and security and includes the international politics of disease, global pandemics and epidemic preparedness, the international politics of HIV AIDS, 
as well as theories of security in international relations and beyond. Recently, um, Stefan, you completed a uh, five-year project um, funded by the a, a European Research Council on pharmaceuticals and security. So we also see here this nexus between technology and security in health. Um, and we have published widely more than 20 um, peer-reviewed publications in one of the best um, journals of our trade, including the, uh, the Review of International Political Economy, Security Dialogue, or the European Journal of International Security. Moreover, and in addition to many of the other chapters and drafts and publications, I just want to mention two books out of five monographs you've already authored, which are directly relevant for tonight's um, lecture. First of all, Security and Global Health Towards the Medicalization of Insecurity, uh, published 2010 in Polit the Politic Press, where um, Stefan has explored the medicalization of security in close ties with the securitization of health, uh, also has revolving around um, these issues. And more recently, in 2018, 18 Pandemics, Pills and Politics, Governing Global Health Security, published at Johns Hopkins University Press. And this is a very nice and thoughtful book also um, on the history of Tamiflu, the, the drug that is taken by so many people worldwide against pandemic um, flu. And it details how this drug was developed, how it was procured by public authorities in order to um, guard against flu and all the intricacies and conflicts that also um, have arisen in this, in this process. And if I'm right, I think this book is, um, is even um, open access, right? You can... You can <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's free. <laughs> but it also fits very nice as a hardcover into every library of <laughs> yours, but it's, I, I really like the idea of free books and available knowledge. And thank you so much. I hand over now to you, and we're delighted to hear your thoughts on global health security now. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you for those very generous words of introduction. I think I'm going to blush now after everything <laughs> you just said. But, but thank you for the invitation and for being uh, with an exemplary host uh, for, for my visit. Thank, thank you very much. And happy birthday to the Institute. 40 years. You know, I, I have a little center, and it's, it's going to be 10 years soon. <laughs> you say working tirelessly for 40 years. I know exactly what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, so happy birthday uh, to the Institute. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. My, my talk uh, today is going to be kind of a horizon tour around this, this field of, of global health security, which has really kind of come to the fore over the past 20 years. So, so really what I'd like to do in the talk is first of all, delve in a little bit in terms of what do we mean by global health security and what is driving this merging of health and security in the 21st century. And then I'm then going to talk a little bit about the kind of different things that are being done to govern this thing called global health security. And we're going to focus particularly on kind of pharmaceutical strategies for managing uh, these threats. And then finally, I'm also going to talk a little bit about innovation and actually how governments are going about the quite challenging task of trying to get pharmaceutical companies to develop new medicines and vaccines in this field. And then I'm going to just draw a couple conclusions at the end. So let's start, uh, let's jump straight in. Uh, so <clears throat> many moons ago, when uh, I was still a teenager, uh, security looked a little bit like this. So I grew up in what used to be the American sector of West Berlin, this would be back in the 1980s. Uh, and security was pretty much about armed force. And what's this about armed force? It was about trying to avoid a nuclear confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. 21st century, understandings of security changed and changed quite rapidly. So I'm going to start with a couple of dates from the past two decades that really exemplify this change. First date is right at the beginning of the 21st century, which is the 10th of January 2000. We'll take you to the US, to United Nations Security Council. 
10th of January 2000, the Security Council meets for the first time in the 21st century. So it's a bit of a symbolic meeting. Also has some pretty high level representation. So you can see the then Secretary General Kofi Annan is there in the background. Al Gore, who was then Vice President of the United States, is chairing the session. Most important thing about this, though, is not just that it's a symbolic meeting, it's that it's what they're talking about. Because the topic of the meeting was the threat that HIV AIDS posed to international peace and security in Africa. This was pretty major because this was the first time <coughs> in over 50 years in the history of the United Nations Security Council that they talked about a health issue or as a disease. There's a lot of concern at the time about very high HIV prevalence rates in some militaries. Estimates for sub-Saharan African militaries in excess of 50% for some armed forces. There were concerns, bearing in mind that medicines weren't yet widely available, about state stability and societies collapsing as even civilian infection rates became very high. There was also a problem close to home for the United Nations because they were doing a lot of peacekeeping operations. And so they had a lot of peacekeepers from the militaries that were estimated to have very high HIV prevalence rates, and so there was a risk that peacekeeping operations were actually inadvertently also spreading HIV globally. But so this was a pretty major turning point. Probably, if you had to signal out one date for the birth of health security, this might well be it. The second date I've chosen for you is 2003, so just a couple of years later. And mentally, we're going halfway across the world now to Asia, to Hong Kong, not Hong Kong Island, where you land nowadays, but Kowloon, and the Metropole Hotel. Very nice hotel, four stars, for those who are interested in traveling to Hong Kong. 21st of February, 2003, a Chinese national checks in to this hotel, Dr. Lu Jinlun. He has come from southern China. He's quite excited to be in Hong Kong because his daughter is getting married, but he's also feeling a bit under the weather. Checks in, he's given a room on the ninth floor. Within days, unfortunately, he would be dead. Turned out he was a medical doctor, and in southern China, he was treating some patients who had presented with what, what was diagnosed at the time as atypical pneumonia. It's a kind of respiratory problem, but wasn't quite sure what it was. Turned out that those were some of the first human cases of infection with a new coronavirus that causes severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS for short. Also staying at this hotel are tourists, business travelers, and some airlines also using it for their flight crews. So within, a, within hours, this coronavirus is traveling, connectivity, airline networks, to other parts of Asia, as far afield as North America, Canada, flights to Frankfurt, etc. In the end, there were 8,000, over 8,000 confirmed cases of SARS. Over half of those, 4,000, were traced back to this one person. That's why in epidemiological terms, he's referred to as a super spreader. <laughs> What's interesting about SARS, though, is that whereas with AIDS and HIV, they were still, you know, everybody saw, well, you know, what's the link between health and security? And we have to kind of link it still to militaries and peacekeepers and this kind of thing. By the time SARS happened, it was clear that within increased globalization, et cetera, et cetera, an infectious disease outbreak is a big problem in and of itself. So when we talk about SARS, we weren't talking about militaries anymore, but it was really there was massive economic damage, tens of billions of lost GDP in, in one economic quarter alone. There was fear, you know, Cathay Pacific was flying empty 747s in and out of Hong Kong. It was clear that with, you know, increased circulation, uh, an outbreak is a security threat almost in its own right. It doesn't have to be linked anymore to the conventional notion of, of understanding of security as armed conflict. No longer had uh, the SARS the settled that we have an outbreak of pandemic influenza, initially uh, H5N1, also known as bird flu. After that, we had H1N1, swine flu. And then just a few years ago, we had the biggest Ebola outbreak in West Africa in history. And of course, there's an Ebola outbreak uh, going on at the moment in the DNC uh, as well. Back to the Security Council. So almost kind of coming full circle. So these kind of dates show you what is really one of the main drivers of health security, which is 
growing number, increased number of naturally occurring outbreaks in the 21st century. But this is only one driver. There's also a second driver. So I've got another date for you guys. 2001, September 2001, back to the East Coast of America. But we're not going to talk about 9 11. We're going to talk about September 18th. And we're going to go down to New Jersey, about 100 miles south of Manhattan, and look at these three mailboxes. Box standard US Postal Office mailboxes. 18th of September 2003, somebody deposits some letters in there that are addressed to uh, people in the US media, like Tom Brokaw, to senators, uh, to US Congress, and other high profile people. The letters have all kinds of threatening messages. The letters are a bit mean as well. Look at this one here. Fourth grade Greendale School. So if you look at this, it looks like it's like a high school or not a high school, elementary school class writing in. You open the letters, you get the <coughs> messages, and of course there's a white powder in there because these letters also had anthrax in them. At the time, again, this caused a major stir. So Capitol Hill in the United States was shut down. Quite high level US government officials, including in the security field, didn't know whether they had been exposed or not. So people like Condoleezza Rice, national security advisor at the time, Dick Cheney, vice president, had to be isolated. And for a few days, they didn't know whether they had been exposed to anthrax or not. Wasn't though just the VIPs, because they had been mailed to the regular US Postal Service, basically had to go and trace back all the ways in which these letters had circulated through the postal system and find all the people who may have been come in contact with the machinery through which the letters had passed. So it's not just Congress that was shut down, but there were also, uh, in the end, uh, five people who died and 17 other people who became uh, infected. So the deliberate, the threat of a deliberate release of a harmful infectious disease agent is the second big driver. This is quite some time ago, but we know intelligence agencies continue to warn that groups like Al Qaeda are still interested in developing the kinds of technologies that could lead to a deliberate release. This is, a, this is taken from a, from a propaganda video from, from Al Qaeda. And we also know that the capabilities of actually manipulating and fiddling the kinds of organisms that cause infectious disease outbreaks are also becoming more widely and more easily available. There are a couple of famous stories where people were able to source different bits of a virus online from companies and just purchase them and kind of assemble them uh, together. So intent and capability also coming together to generate fear of a deliberate risk. And that's the kind of, in addition to the natural outbreaks, this is the second big driver. There's also a third one. This happened quite recently. Look at this. Explosion hits Russian virology in the border where smallpox, anthrax, and Ebola strains are stored. So this is important because, um, irrespective of a natural outbreak or the or deliberate release, something might just also go wrong. You might have an accident. This is an example of an accident. Uh, you have a huge number of laboratories where these kinds of pathogens are being worked on. My famous example, though, for this bit are these two chaps. These smiling guys are both virologists. Yoshi Kawaoka on the left, Ron Couchet on the right. He works at University of Tokyo and Madison, Wisconsin. He's at the Erasmus Medical Center uh, in Holland. So if you think back, remember H5N1, bird flu? So this was a really nasty virus. Mortality rate in human beings is about 60%. So if you got this virus, 60% chance you were not uh, going to make it. There was all this fear about the bird flu pandemic, and then the pandemic never came. But there never was an h 5 one pandemic. And the reason was that, you know, h 5 one viruses are is really bad for birds. Like their mortality rate is even higher. It's, it's practically 100% for birds within 48 hours. If a bird contracts H501, it's going to die and it's going to die very quickly. But what the 
the virus doesn't do is spread very easily between human beings. So although people were contracting H5N1, it was mostly people who were in close direct contact with infected birds. What wasn't happening is this kind of infectious chain reaction where it was then spreading between people like the normal flu does. And that's why we haven't had a pandemic. So these two scientists said, well, this, is, if this actually generates a quite interesting scientific question, which is, is it even possible for these H5N1 viruses to mutate in a way that they could become airborne transmissible in humans, as would be required to have this kind of infectious chain reaction? So they designed an experiment. Not with human beings, you can't do it, 60% fatality rate, who would sign up? Instead, they use ferrets. Ferrets don't look anything like human beings, but are actually, when it comes to flu, a very well characterized animal model because their lungs have a lot of similarities with human beings. Also, they do things like sneeze, which is what human beings do. And so they have an experiment where they say, okay, we have a box, and we have a ferret over here, and we have a ferret over here. And then we have a gap in between these two boxes. So we have, a, we have a wall here, and we have a wall here. And then the walls have lots of holes in them, kind of like a Swiss cheese. But basically, if you can infect this ferret with an H5N1 virus, and then this ferret becomes ill, you have an airborne transmissible flu virus, because there's no other way that the virus can get from one cage to the other. So Yoshi and Ron both uh, did experiments on this. They used very different ways and experimental designs to do this. But they were both successful in producing the same viruses that everybody was worried by their Kardashian, which is airborne transmissible H5N1 viruses. And because it was great science, what they did, they then wrote up their manuscripts and they submitted them to science and to nature, at which point the security community had a collective cardiac arrest because they were basically putting out the recipe of how you would design these very dangerous pathogens. And this was, it was obviously the kind of the bioterrorism risk that we were just talking about. Who gets to have this knowledge? But it was also, what if it just gets out of the lab because they're not careful enough in the laboratory? Okay. So this is, there's now a whole terminology around dual use research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, but the key point is that increasingly, we're not only dealing with natural outbreaks, or even just with the threat of a deliberate, but also with an accidental. There's a huge amount of university laboratories that deal with viruses. There are also a lot of commercial companies that have laboratories that do science. And whilst everybody was getting up and wrong, on Ron and, and Yoshi for doing these experiments, the Chinese quietly slip out that Chen Huolan at the Harvard Veterinary Institute had done over 120 different versions of these viruses in China. So it's not just a European issue. So these, um, I think, are really the three main drivers bringing together global health and security. If you, this is a graphic representation, it's not mine, uh, it comes from a US government institution, but you can see it's from September 2011. Just shows you a kind of frequency of things uh, that are going on. For 2018, I had a look at the World Health Organization. We had over 84 outbreaks uh, of very different, various different magnitudes last year alone. All of this has given rise discursively to this notion of health security. There is no universally agreed definition of health security. If something comes close, it's this. This is from the 2007 uh, World Health Report, and you can read it for yourself. Uh, but it's probably the, the most influential definition of health security. So what I've just shown you, really, and just to wrap up, is really the process that we might call the securitization of health. It has been a process over the past 20 years, driven by these three drivers, whereby health has also become linked to and thought of and responded to as a security issue. And it's mostly around kind of lethal infectious diseases. 
What I want to do now is move on to the second bit and talk a little bit about governing global health security. Okay, so these threats are kind of building up. What is actually being done to manage these? First is that you see um, health security rapidly kind of ratcheting up government agendas. So whereas when I was still a student, I, did, I don't think I had a single session on health and it would have been considered low politics, it's now become a high politics issue. If you look at key documents like US national security strategies, UK national security strategies, the UK risk register, they all now have references to health security. And not just, by the way, in the annex or in a footnote or at the back of the document, but actually on par with terrorism or greater than terrorism is a common kind of phrase uh, or idiom that we see in these documents. Institutional adaptation. National Security Council of the United States of America. The president has the briefing every morning. Clinton started in 98. First National Security Advisor for International Health was appointed. Ken Bernard was his name. They used to make fun. So Ken said he went, went to the first National Security Council meeting and he was introduced as the first uh, senior advisor for international health. All the guys who came with the nukes and the, and the real security stuff would make fun of him. And they're like, you know, Ken, you know, I just had a jog around the White House and my knees were really acting up and, you know, would you mind having a look? Uh, of course, it became very quickly institutionalized because, you know, of, of a number of different threats that bubble up. But you also see, you know, the Pentagon has an office on global health activities and affairs. Department of Homeland Security also see institutional adaptation and innovation. You get not only existing institutions changing their portfolio to include health issues, you also get whole new initiatives. We've already talked about the Security Council, talked about health, right? That's more adaptation. But the EU, 2003, creates a new Health Security Committee. Initially an informal committee, uh, a few years later, was given proper legal grounding to deal with cross-border threats in the European Union. Health is a derogated matter for member states in the EU, but not cross-border health threats. EU has competency there. Global Health Security Initiative. You can see the countries involved here with the flags. Okay, so again, high-level ministerial cooperation on managing these health-based threats. More recently, we've had another one, which is not represented here, which is called the Global Health Security Agenda, which was launched by the Obama administration and now has over 70 countries around the world signed up to it. You have think tanks like this one doing a lot of work to actually bring the health and security communities closer together. CSIS in Washington, D.C. This, as you can see, country right at the moment uh, is Chairman House, uh, Lori Garrett at the Council on Foreign Relations, etc. The key thing is you have to get health people and secure people to talk to one another. Modeling. Okay, so a lot of work going on with professional modelers to understand where are population densities, what are the where do people move and flow, and trying to therefore model different diseases with different rates of replication and speed of travel, how quickly and where they would spread around the world. New infrastructures. This is a picture of an emergency operations centers. So many people will be familiar from the security field with the idea of a war room, where if there's a war, you have a kind of central location from where you direct and exercise command and control. We see the same thing happening now in health institutions. This is at the World Health Organization in Geneva. This is the Strategic Health Operations Center. They have snazzy things like monitors that electronically go up and down on the table. They have their own independent power supply. Uh, what you can't see here on the photo is that the whole thing is surrounded by glass. You can flick a switch and it goes all like foggy so that you can't see through it anymore, so that it can be private. And aspiration now is that every country around the world should have their own EOC. Is so that it's like a showpiece thing and there's all the jealousy and, and, and <laughs> health ministers go to Geneva and then I'd like to have one in my Industry as well, and so there's a big industry that's a whole different story about building this. Performativity, right? So you have to see how would we actually, would we be able to cope in an outbreak? So you have simulation exercises. 
host countries, as uh, the EU as well, will actually pretend, like let's pretend we have an outbreak, and they generate like fake news feeds, etc. and then they get all the ministers around to kind of play outbreak games, pandemic games, to see whether and how the governments would react. You see, here's Madeleine Albright, she's a quite senior, she used to be uh, Secretary of State for the US government, uh, participating in a classic one, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Storm. New surveillance systems using the internet. One of the big problems you have with outbreaks is that it's up to countries and governments to declare them. So one of the big issues in SARS was people thought something was going on, but until the Chinese government officially said, we have an issue, there wasn't really a lot that international organizations could do. So they evolved all kinds of systems that use technology and algorithms to try and get more surveillance data. GFED, I can talk, I can go on for hours about each of these. They have, they have their own little intricacies, but this one's quite interesting. So GFED comes out of Canada. Canada's really good at automatic translation because it's a bilingual country, French, English. So they designed a system that would scour the internet continuously for open source media reports of outbreaks. Okay. And then they, they, they built the system up and up and up, up so it uses eight different languages. And the idea is that if some weird disease presents somewhere, some local reporter is going to write it up and might even file it on the internet as like a, might be published on the internet as a story. So rather than waiting for governments to report, we can just gather all this data, that they have algorithmic programs to score these reports. <coughs> if, it, if it goes past a threshold score, they have three teams in Ottawa, uh, working in eight hour shifts that will then go, it will go to a human analyst to evaluate whether a new outbreak might be occurring. More recently, a lot of this has been linked in with, uh, with Google, who are also a big player in, in this kind of surveillance, to give it kind of more, a better geographic uh, and geospatial uh, interface. You also have uh, more old school surveillance, which is, uh, so in most American cities now, they have a new network, this is called BioWatch. Maybe just focus on this picture. Keep thinking in this picture here is this white little box here. That's in Union Square and lots of other locations, but it's classified where they are. I can't actually tell you where they are. These are air samplers, so they're continuously taking samples of the air in order to see whether anything has been released. And guys come around, they take it, and then they take it off to the labs and, and, uh, and test it. Okay? So this is just a flavor. I could go on about all of these things because they're all really fascinating for a variety of different reasons. But the piece that I want to focus on now, in terms of now, is also the pharmaceutical piece. Okay? Because despite all of these things that I just rattled through, the kind of classic million dollar question, whenever there's a new outbreak, is always, do we have a safe and effective medicine or vaccine available? Okay? This is usually the number one question. And the reason there are many reasons why this is actually why this ends up being the key question for clinical health security. One is, well, it's probably the question that would come to our mind. You know, if we wake up one morning and hear about a new disease we've never heard about, the first thing for our own kind of welfare, our own self concern, would be to find out is there a cure or a treatment available. It's really important for governments because there's no guarantee that all of these things that I just talked about are actually going to work. Right? And even if you spot an outbreak, it might not be able or possible to contain it in time. So another way of thinking about the pharmaceutical piece is kind of like as a backstop. It's the ultimate guarantee that if everything else fails, at least you can still have the medical or pharmaceutical ability to treat it. <coughs> For some governments, it's also a legal responsibility to do whatever they can to protect their populations. This is really important in America in terms of constitutional arrangements. But finally, I think the pharmaceutical piece is also actually really important for kind of socioeconomic reasons. Okay, so a lot of the more traditional public health measures, like quarantine, isolation, are from a socioeconomic perspective almost as bad as the disease itself. Because everybody has to stay in their home, all the systems of circulation that you need to generate wealth or society to function get shut down. 
Okay. Whereas, if you have a pharmaceutical solution, you can manage this whilst keeping all these systems of circulation that are crucial for society going. So for very different reasons, a kind of pharmaceutical piece becomes really important. So important that we have a new word for it. Medical countermeasures. Okay. Medical countermeasures entails a variety of things, but the easy way to think about it is pharmaceutical responses for managing health-based threats. The imaginary or the dream behind medical countermeasures is a twofold. This comes from the US. Our nation must have a system that is nimble and flexible enough to produce medical countermeasures quickly in the face of an attack or threat, whether it's one we know about today or a new one. So the idea is, let's figure out what's out there and design stuff against what's out there, but let's also have the platforms and the infrastructures in place so that if we get caught by surprise and something new comes, we have the ability to respond. Okay. So what I'm going to do the next part of the talk now is open up this world of medical countermeasures for you because when I heard about this, I had no idea what is a medical countermeasure and, and how, you know, how do these things get developed and it's, you know, it's highly technical and it turns out it's also highly challenging. And the way we began to explore this world is to say, you know what, there's so many diseases and there's so much going on we can't actually handle it. It's just it's too much information and it's going to be too much work. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take one medical countermeasure and we're going to look at this medical countermeasure from the moment it was born all the way to the point that it gets developed and used in an emergency. Like the whole life of a medical countermeasure. And this is how we will open up and explore this area. We have to choose one. If anybody wants to ask me in Q&A about why we chose this one, I'm happy to explain about it, but we chose cabbie flu which was stockpiled by, by, by many governments around the world against pandemic flu. And what we learned from pandemic flu is just how hard it is to develop pharmaceutical products in the area of health security. So what follows is the top 10 challenges that, you will conf that any government will confront if you want to develop and in medical kind of it's all. I'm not going to go in detail about Tamiflu because it's just one case study, but I want to suck out the big, the big challenges. And because tens a lot, we're going to do it in three groups. Okay, so the first ones are the development challenges. First challenge, scientific. Okay, and in order to get a new medicine or a new vaccine, you have to have a scientific breakthrough. Just because you want one doesn't mean you can get one. In the case of Tamiflu, there was decades of science that had to happen before they could actually decode the exact molecular structure of flu viruses, see that the flu virus is always mutating, find the space within the flu virus that doesn't mutate, and then design a whole new molecule that can attach to that part, and then begin to interfere with the process of viral replication in the human body. Okay? It's building on decades Science. It didn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen in a linear fashion. Scientific challenge is the first development challenge. Number two, many of you will know this, economic developing new medicines is really expensive. Estimates are controversial, but as a ballpark figure, you're looking at around a billion US dollars to develop new medicine. There's not a lot of companies. There's tons and tons of pharmaceutical companies in the world, but there's very few that have the financial muscle to actually put that kind of money behind a product before it even begins to, re to generate any kind of return on investment. So it's not just science, it's science and commerce, just to get a product off the ground. It actually turns out, you know, one of the things that I thought before I had the project is health security is really great for pharmaceutical companies because, you know, they're going to look. But it turns out all these big companies, they're really not interested in health security at all. This is like small fry compared to cancer, of lots of other conditions. They are mostly driven by market forces. Most pharmaceutical production is done by private companies. They are driven by market forces. And because the costs for developing drugs is roughly the same for different diseases, they chase the diseases with the largest markets. 
from medical coverage to just open commercial market. Nobody has smallpox, right? So who's going to buy this stuff? So at most, you're looking at a few government buyers who have the money and the foresight to stop costs of like this. So actually, it turns out big pharma not really that key. Third thing, third challenge is the valley of death. Okay, so this what I was just saying about big pharma is not just a financial problem. Basically, you need a lot of specific knowledge and skills to develop a pharmaceutical product, especially at the later stages where you're doing clinical trials, where you're designing manufacturing capabilities. So normally, what happens? is that we have small biotech companies, or maybe even scientists in the university, come up with a promising molecule. But then that's as far as they can take it. And then they license it to one of these big guys that I was just talking about, to put the money and the expertise behind it to actually bring it to market. So the fact that Big Pharma isn't interested because of commercial reasons, also then generates a huge technical gap here that there's nobody there to take these products forward in the case of medical coverages, which is why you get this, what the industry analysts call a valley of death. Okay? So these are the challenges just to develop a new product. Let's assume, it's a big assumption, that you can get through all of this, and you've got a new product that can treat one of these, uh, one of these infectious diseases. Then we get into the acquisition challenges. The acquisition challenges are, how do you turn a new drug into a pharmaceutical capability that you could use in an actual outbreak. A couple additional things have to happen. Number one is you need regulatory approval. Who's going to take it if it hasn't been licensed and approved? FDA in the US, European Medi Medicines Agency in the EU. How do you get regulatory approval? Way to clinical trials. You start from phase one to phase two to phase three, small groups, bigger, bigger. You test it in human beings, and you show that it's safe and that it works. And then you give the paperwork to the regulators, and they tell you whether they believe you or not, and whether they approve the drug. Fact. When you do it for a medical cover measure, how are you going to do the clinical trials? Nobody has smallpox. It's in two labs, you know, in America and Russia. You have no population on which to run clinical trials. Is anybody going to say, please infect me with smallpox because I want to be part of the clinical trial? It's not going to happen, it will be unethical. If you can't even run a clinical trial, how are you going to get your medical product medical license? Regulatory challenges. Number five is the demand management challenge. How much are we going to need for our population of this thing? So, if you're looking at a particular type of cancer or any other medical condition, there's statistics. You can say this is how many people have suffered from this condition every year, and you can begin to plan and make business models, figure out how much you need. With an outbreak, you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know where it's going to happen. You don't know if it's going to happen. For the companies, this is a huge problem. They can't do economic modeling with this kind of variation. For the governments, it's a big problem because it's like, if we buy too much of this stuff and waste a whole bunch of money and never use it, we're going to get it in the net. If something happens and we don't have enough, we're also going to get it in the net. So it's a, it's a tricky one. This is a, this is a, this is a UK tenant from stockpile. UK stockpile enough for 80% of the UK population. This is what it looks like. Demand management. Le logistical challenge. Let's say you've got your stock, you've got your product, and you've got it approved, and you've got your stock, you've got your stock piled. Are you, are you done? Are you prepared? No, you're not prepared. Because a stockpile is absolutely useless unless you can actually get the medicine from your stockpile to the people who need it. So, logistical challenge. Yeah, if you have the normal medicine, you say, okay, I'm just going to go to the pharmacy, right, and pick it up. Well, pharmacies aren't going to stock this stuff because in normal conditions, nobody suffers from smallpox. So they're not going to hold this. There's not going to be a natural amount in the system. Plus, all your existing logistical systems might become 
disrupted in a pandemic because people aren't showing up for work or staying at home or afraid. So people, you know, Americans thought about using school buses, you know, the nice yellow ones to distribute it. Other people made contracts with logistical companies. Some people are thinking about using the military. So as you can get it to the people rapidly who need it, you don't have a capability. And often, again, they talk about the last mile, right? It's the hardest. How do you actually give it to the person? So, let's say you've done all that. So you've got the new draft, you've got it stockpiled, you've got your logistical strategy. Are you there yet? No, you're not there yet. Because what happens if actually an outbreak happens? And you actually have to push the button and roll this out to the population. You get four final challenges. Global supply. If it's a global outbreak or something that could spread globally, all of a sudden you have a situation where everybody wants it. This is what happened with Tammy Food, right? There's not enough for everybody to go around. Who's going to get it? Who's going to have access to it? Who is going to have to do without it? How, if at all, can the supply chain be increased? Again, bearing in mind that there's no routine civilian demand for this, and that pharmaceutical production is quite complex, it has to be done to high standards, because it's stuff that actually goes into people's bodies. It's not like picking a switch. It has to be done about that. Intellectual property. Pharmaceutical products are very sophisticated, technically. A lot of science goes into them. But they're also quite easy to copy by people who know what they're doing. Just like movies. You know, people used to, you wouldn't yourself be able to copy a DVD, but there were people who knew how to do it and could make really cheap copies. Okay? So the industry, from their perspective, right, they need patents. And not only do they need patents in their country, they need global patents. So they don't get ripped off by, by generics. So they defend patents up to the hilt. For them, there is no industry, but whether you like it or not, patents are key for them. And so they've been also pushing through the WTO for trips, uh, uh, protections of patents, protections, and so forth. One of the things that turns out around patent law is that you can suspend <laughs> patents in a security crisis. So UK domestic legislation, if the US is facing a security threat, they can size the patents, ask other companies to produce a drug. The same at the international level with TRIPS. Okay? These patents are protected, but nothing shall prevent a member state from, that is facing a national security crisis from size stepping in. From a commercial point of view, this is a problem. Because it means, ironically, that at the one moment that having taken all these risks, you might finally achieve a problem. Like a problem. Everybody else can just say, well, this is a security crisis, and override the patent. So it's one of the peculiar features of medical countermeasures that at the one point where they could return the profit, other people actually have the greatest power to override the patents. That doesn't make it very attractive from a commercial point of view. Number nine, we're almost at the end. And it's supposed to be painful, by the way, I'm trying to get across how just how complicated it is. Liabilities. Okay? To show that a drug is safe, you would normally do clinical trials. Again, you would start with a small number of people, you would build up. Okay? But even for a normal product, you might only have a few thousand people in the initial clinical trials, which will capture most side effects, and especially common side effects. But it might not capture a side effect that happens, say, less than 1 in 10,000. But as you roll out a new drug, right, and people use it, you might get things get flagged up that adverse reactions happen, and you can kind of generally, you know, you can withdraw the product or whatever. In a medical countermeasure situation, right, you might be in a situation where you would almost overnight be giving a new drug, not to 10,000 people, but to 100,000, to a million people. At which point, a side effect, even a small one, that only occurs, say, 1 in 10,000, becomes significant. Because it's enough people to be a problem, and it will generate media headlines, 
because that kind of thing is also very media friendly, and that will then eat into the trust for the people who actually use the medicine. Huh? And in a litigious society like America, this could be the end of your business. If you face a mass, if, you know, if, 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 if some side effect occurs that you weren't aware, class action lawsuit, I could put the company out of business. So the question of how to deal with liabilities once you actually roll out a product in an emergency is another huge challenge. Last but not least, number 10. One of the things that happened in the Tamiflu case was once it was stockpiled and it was rolled out to people in the UK, everybody started saying, well, actually, where's the data behind all of this? We, you know, we want to check just to make sure it's, it's safe. But it turns out a lot of data wasn't in the public domain. It didn't actually legally have to be in the public domain. Most of it is held by pharmaceutical companies, and some of it is given to regulators. During the pandemic flu, this became unsustainable. There's a huge fight about the data. And Roche, the pharmaceutical company, in a sense, in the end, lost a long legal battle and had to make all the data around pandemic flu openly available. Of course, again, that is great. Right, because it leads to more data openness. But from a commercial point of view, it creates additional problems. Because for the companies, the pharmaceutical products are informed products. What you're selling is the biochemical compound, together with all the information about its safety, efficacy, how it works around it. A lot of the data is commercially proprietary. And so again, if companies know at the beginning, that they're going to have to share all the data about this product with everybody else. This is going to create, this, this is going to be unattractive from the commercial point of view. So it adds a complication. So by this point, you may be either exhausted or bored or a combination of both. But the point is, just because we have a US document saying we're going to have medical coverage, doesn't mean it's very easy. In fact, Procuring pharmaceutical innovation, even for normal diseases, is already challenging. Doing it in a security context is even more difficult for all of the reasons that I just tried to say. So, can it be done? Are we all doomed when the next outbreak happens? One country has tried more than most others to try and make it happen, despite all these challenges, and that's the United States of America. And they came up with something called the U.S. Medical Countermeasure Enterprise, or FEMKI for short. This is a graphic representation of FEMKI. These are all the different organizations, CDC, FDA, military, that are all involved in this effort. I don't have time to talk you through all of this, but I will give you the top five things that they did to make this happen. Number one money. Government-backed market for medical countermeasures. The commercial market is not going to do it. George W. Bush started with Project <coughs> BioShield, 7.1 billion over 10 years. That money has now expired, but it still runs through annual appropriations. Okay? Government-backed market. Money. Number two, regulatory adaptation. Okay? When it comes to medical countermeasures, not for normal products, for medical countermeasures, you can use animal models to demonstrate the efficacy, to get around this problem with clinical trials. Another bit of regulatory adaptation is emergency use authorization. It's a legal mechanism that allows the US government to use pharmaceutical products for purposes other than that, that knows that they are approved for. So Tamiflu was approved for seasonal flu, but not for pandemic flu, but they could use it in a pandemic using an EUA. You can even under EUA use unapproved products. So if you have a product that's not fully licensed yet, you can use it. So in addition to money, we have regulatory adaptation. We have stockpiling. So to deal with the supply chain and the logistical distribution thing, US creates a strategic national stockpile. It's about six major warehouses across the continental United States. It has inventory of around seven billion US dollars, over 901 items that could be rapidly deployed within the US. <clears throat> Fourth thing is you have the PrEP Act. The PrEP Act basically gives the companies, pharmaceutical companies, protection from lawsuits. 
So if you take a medical kind of measure and you get a side effect and you are ill or you die, you can't sue the company, except if you can prove that it was willful misconduct. So if you can show like that they falsified data or anything else. But basically, if it looks like they did the best they could, but, but you know, we just didn't know, they would be exempt from lawsuits. Product. Last but not least, remember that slide about the valley of death and the gap because Big Pharma doesn't come in? They've kind of built a government-backed mini pharmaceutical company called BART, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. What BARDA does is they hire ex-industry people, often towards the end of their career. And because Big Pharma is not interested in that kind of measures, they then make this expertise available to smaller companies who are working on developing new medical kind of measures. They tell them about how they can design their production capabilities, how they can do regulatory approval, what kind of clinical trial models might be appropriate to get in service. So it's, it's not a private company, it's a government organization, but it functions a lot like a kind of virtual big pharma company to fill that gap called the Valley of Death that we talked about. Okay? Have they been successful? Well, the US system has generated around 20 new products since the inception of BARDA. Which doesn't sound like a huge amount, but when you think about how hard it actually is to develop this product, it's not, it's not an un unusable amount. But what's quite interesting is that they've really only been able to do it in the end by creating a quite a parallel or an exceptional pharmaceutical regime for medical countermeasures. Right? The normal system doesn't work. So they've created a kind of new assemblage within the wider civilian bioeconomy just for medical countermeasures. And they've made new funding, regulatory adaptation, a few other legal changes, in order to kind of incentivize innovation in this area. Let me conclude with uh, three sets of conclusions about some of the wider implications of all of this. I will go from specific, specific to large. Uh, so specifically, This thing, this medical kind of measure enterprise, which is the closest thing that currently exists in the world in terms of developing new medical kind of measures, faces challenges. One obvious one is that it's only here to the United States. Right? This is all a US program. And so it means it doesn't have the scale nor necessarily the same priorities as the rest of the world. And so the question of internationalization it's a big unresolved thing. There are some new initiatives like CEPI, I can talk more about that, that are trying to kind of globalize some of the lessons from this from a more kind of global health perspective. But how to internationalize is a big challenge. Second challenge is uh, trust. Because the government is in a bit of an awkward situation here. On the one hand, you can see they're bending over backwards to incentivize private industry to develop these medical countermeasures. At the same time, we rely on the government to regulate the industry. Right? So the government is here as being quite flexible in order to get these products approved. Some people would say uncomfortably flexible. And so there is still the question about trust. Will people ultimately, when there's an outbreak, trust that the government has been sufficiently detached and removed also from the industry to regulate it properly, especially when looking at whether products are safe and effective. The third challenge that this thing faces is political will. So this was all set up after you know, bioterrorism attacks and, and early concerns with outbreaks, but this whole area suffers a kind of boom and bust situation. When there's an outbreak, everybody's talking about them, but then the outbreak fades, everybody forgets about this again, and then the next one comes along and we start again from the beginning. So the, the, the how to sustain the kind of political will for this <coughs> is really important and is, is a missing piece at the moment. Secondly, I want to also um, talk a little bit about the implications of diplomacy for us, because this is also quite interesting. So because the US is at the forefront of having these technologies, they actually have the power, right? It actually feeds back into kind of call from soft power or global power projection. They now have capabilities in this health security area that others can increase. Don't have. 
This creates sensitivities also for the US government because they're getting more and more requests to share their technology with other countries, which have to be handled quite sensitively. But it also actually creates interesting forms of dependency. So to feed this medical counter measure enterprise, you need things also from the rest of the world. You need samples, specimens of the pathogens, which are often located in four countries. So there have been some really interesting diplomatic battles over recent years. Most famously, Indonesia, during H5N1, was struggling to get access to new vaccines. So the Indonesians invented a concept called viral sovereignty. And they said these H5N1 viruses that are circulating in Indonesia, they belong to Indonesia. And it's a sovereign decision for the government of Indonesia whether we will share these samples or not. And we are only prepared to share if some of the benefits, especially in terms of new medicines, are also held back for low and middle income countries. Okay? So it's power for the US, but it's also dependency and new forms of diplomatic contestation. But the really hot game here in terms of this field of diplomacy is actually growing informationalization of this, which is that now increasingly the science is at the point where they can do this with genetic sequence data of the pathogens. They don't actually need the samples anymore. So all of these frameworks that have been negotiated around material samples are now in jeopardy again as people hammer out how they're going to handle genetic sequence data, okay, which is now almost as valuable as ever. So New sources of diplomatic contestation emerging from all of this. A very different type of science diplomacy. But also really interesting to look at how scientists evolve informal mechanisms for shifting samples and, uh, and data, often under the purview of official regulations. Um, it's a different kind of diplomacy. Last but not least, I also want to focus on one one final point on which I'm going to conclude, and that is it's my last thing. So when you think back to the beginning of my talk, right, and you think about that, that nuclear plume, this was all actually tied in with physics, right? Especially nuclear physics and the splitting of the atom, the harnessing of atomic power. So it's already a precedent that science is actually really central to shaping the way we think about and practice security. What I think more generally we have in this whole domain of global health security is a very similar process, but not with physics, but with biology, especially molecular biology. Okay? So what we have here is, um, you know, I don't want to go too academic, but molecular biology has actually been promulgating a new ontoepistemology of life. Which is to say that molecular biology tells us now that biological life is essentially biochemical. It is the epiphenomenon of tiny processes that occur at molecular scale. And the classic example of this would be the human genome, the decoding of the human genome. Right? But it tells us that we are basically all biochemical machines. This is the ontological plane of molecular biology. But it's also an epistemic because it's actually saying we can understand life by looking at these molecular processes. We can look at the sequences, even, and we can understand which bits to what. And we can render life legible epistemically by sequencing to bioinformatics, etc. So it's a kind of new molecular vision of life or a new molecular ontoepistemology of life. And this is central both to these threats it is by decoding the molecular structure of the flu viruses that we know that they are always changing and that a new pandemic is a question not of if but when. It's the fact that we can play and splice and recombine life at molecular scale that generates the concern about bioterrorism. And it's the scientists fiddling at molecular scale with these things in their laboratories that is generating the fear about an accident or release. So this molecular vision of life is tied in both to the threat, first of all, to the threat perception, but then secondly, also into all these medical countermeasures. Because these medical countermeasures, when you strip it back 
these pharmaceutical products are essentially new molecules, right? They are synthetic, artificially designed molecules for which the pill or the capsule is the delivery device for the human body. So it is all actually a story about the co-production of science and security, but not physics, molecular biology. And perhaps even more than that, it's actually, in a way, also a sense in which security is changing today in the 21st century, because actually our underlying understanding of life itself is also changing. And I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. giving us this tour de raison through all this um, genealogy emergence of this topic and also especially thank you for walking us through the 10 challenges. I really liked it, the complexities of pharmaceutical development and also for wrapping up with this philosophical and theoretical account of what it means to live in this biomedical world we're living in at the moment and what this means for security. Um, I have many questions I will hold back at the moment and I would say at open the floor for our guests, our audience um, and we can discuss um, Clemens. Maybe um, you can all, yeah. always introduce yourself. Um, my name is Clemens and I work here at Institute. Um, and I was um, embedding in, in the large topic of which is governing health security. So um, you talk, talk, gave a lot of information on how the supply works and how the government side works. But I was wondering if there are not enough doctors and if there is not a healthy um, health infrastructure in a state, in a city. Um, I mean, all these efforts are basically meaningless. So I was wondering if we take this on this. And uh, actually, if doctors are also involved in making up these strategies of the epidemics and um, trained in a way that they can cope with the outbreak of an ep epidemic because uh, they have to, I don't know, distribute vaccines in, in a short amount of time. Uh, and also, on a larger question, if this security on ex by exception, so I mean an epidemic is an exceptionalism in, in this case, but wouldn't it be more, uh, wouldn't it be better to actually take from a, from a policy point of view to take it back to a security as normal politics and, uh, this, and prepare health systems on a daily basis actually and really involve doctors and see doctors as in a very orthodox Paris school way as security practitioners. Great, so thank you. So, yeah, uh, sure. Yes, sure. Okay. So, um, wow, so there's a, there's a lot going on. The, the, so the first is, and I'll uh, just give you an example of Tamiflu, uh, is that actually you, you and, and I say this in jestingly, you don't want the doctors involved, okay? Because it actually takes too long, okay? So uh, uh, if, if, if each person who's going to get them in a kind of has to first speak to a doctor, it, usually the time scales are such as that, that it becomes impractical. And, and this was one of the big controversies in the UK because they, they developed this thing called the pandemic flu system or Tamiflu during H1N1. And basically, all you, you, you would either ring up you know, a call center or you would go online and they would ask you, do you have a temperature? They would ask you to tick a couple things. And then based on this kind of very simple algorithm, they would decide whether to give you a prescription for Tamiflu or not. And then to collect the Tamiflu, you, you, you would not go to the doctor, to the pharmacy, but to a government collection point. So the doctors were, were, were um, re really cut out, and, but, and some of them were, were, were understandably quite unhappy about it, but it was felt that was the, the, the only way to do it. There's another problem with, with relying on doctors, is that, of course, the doctors themselves may get sick, and actually, doctor surgeries may actually incubate and spread a lot of, if, every, if everybody who's sick goes to the same place, even if that's a medical place, that, that could also be, be uh, a problem. So the medical authorities, the doctors, are not happy about it. But usually in pandemics, we try to minimize the amount of, of, of involvement. In terms of your larger point, absolutely. So this whole kind of medical countermeasure enterprise is very context specific. 
And when you think of those 10 challenges and everything that you have to have in place, right, it's clear that that really only works in particular countries. Right? It'd be much more difficult to do in a low or middle income country setting. And that's why a lot of the kind of global health security agenda now is actually about fusing the kind of global health security agenda with a move towards more universal healthcare. So ultimately, everybody agrees that yes, you have to have you know good sound health systems would be the basis. But the problem is many countries around the world don't have that, and it might still have to be all dependent. Anna. I was wondering, um, the medical counter measures, the example that you gave us from the US, are there any initiatives like that on a global level? I mean, now you've said that it's very much context dependent, and the stories that you presented us, they depended on the government, and um, I guess um, those pharmaceutical companies are acting globally, but they must be, with some kind of negotiations of the companies with the governments, are there any kind of international organizations involved in developing medical Yes, and again, there's an interesting story there because so basically, you have this whole BARDA US piece, <coughs> and it, it, the criticism that it attracted, right, was about the fact that that was it was quite US centric, and it was national security oriented, and of course, again, you have to bear in mind that that this enterprise doesn't just deal with natural outbreaks, but also with deliberate releases. So there's a lot of sensitivity actually from the government about how much information about the enterprise to put out there because you don't really want to advertise which diseases do we have covered, which ones don't we have covered. And so there's a lot of kind of the traditional national security sensitivities wrapped into that. But just in the past few years, there's been a new initiative called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which is basically kind of trying to do what BARDA did in the US, but on a global scale and looking at diseases that are and prioritizing diseases in low and middle income countries. Uh, and what's even more fascinating about that story is that actually just in the past few years, some of the recent, uh, some of the most senior people from BARDA have actually left BARDA and gone, gone to SEPI. So what you're seeing is a story of, of kind of translation and migration where this initial medical countermeasure knowledge that was honed and developed very specifically for kind of US national security purposes, is now actually being globalized and internationalized with a more kind of global health oriented initiative. So the, 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 the knowledge is moving out of the kind of narrow security field into a, into a wider or kind of more humanitarian uh, global health initiative. But it's some of the same people. There was a question, yeah. then, then Eric. Okay. Uh, Klaus Reynoldner, I am a doctor and a researcher. My background is clinical medicine. I've been working in Congo and in Latin America and in Austria. I have retired from clinical work, but I'm still a researcher in global health and sustainable development. So when I started medicine many years ago, we thought the diseases and we have to cure them with drugs. And uh, over time, I learned uh, that health is not so much depending from drugs it's much more depending from living circumstances. So I'm a little bit surprised that you focus so much on uh, contagious diseases, on communicable diseases, as we have data from World Health Organization that the main health problems on the globe are not anymore communicable diseases in developing countries, it's more non-communicable diseases like cancers, cardiovascular diseases, etc. And we have a big problem that uh, we are burning out our planet by a fossil economy. So if I want to focus on really prevention and security, I would primarily focal, uh, focus on uh, towards an end of fossil economy and uh, towards uh, guaranteeing food security. Think of the last report of the Food Agricultural Organization just about a year ago, when they said after coming down with the number of 100 people over the globe, it is rising up again since three years, and the reason is anthropogenic climate change. Yeah? 
And I also do not agree with your first slide about the nuclear explosion. We haven't abolished nuclear weapons and they are still a threat. Tomorrow is the UN International Day for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. And so many countries have not yet resigned the treaty of the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So I would much more focus on other sides of prevention in order to guarantee security. Although I do not disagree in detail what you have presented today. Great. So your question actually goes to the heart, right, of, of also the, the controversy around global health security. So, but there were many things to your question. The first, the links about climate change, I think, are increasingly well understood, and there are huge linkages now emerging also in the kind of policy world between, between climate change and global health. The second thing is, I think there is something interesting, right, although you can have statistics all day long about what actually generates the biggest burden of disease and what, what creates the most harm, right? There, there, certain issues have a kind of intrinsic securityness, right? And others don't. So when you talk about health security, there are many bigger threats than infectious diseases, but they don't gel in the same way with the kind of logic of security. There's something about microbes that allows them to be thought of very easily in almost militaristic ways, outside invaders who, who Devastate, right? And so it becomes credible and possible to kind of link them in policy debates in ways that would be much more difficult for other health issues, even though those health issues might create a much bigger burden of disease. But then the final question, I think, which is really important here, is the politics, right? So there have been huge global health, and this is why I say your question goes actually to the heart of the field. There have been huge global health inequalities existing in this world for decades. Right? But very little actually gets done. Although we all agree that it's very important to do this, very little is actually done to ameliorate these, these things. Some, so the, the dilemma or, or the argument at the heart of the field is whether the linking or the focus on infectious disease at least begins to build those connections, right? So that at least some action is done on global health issues. Because there can, there can be, it can be understood to be a common interest. It's not to say that those other issues don't exist, but how do you get the political mobilization on a global scale for those issues? And I think there's a long track record which says that just by saying these are big issues and lots of people die isn't enough of a political strategy. So there's a kind of, there's a difficult dilemma, I think, for everybody who's involved, especially on the global health side, how to speak about health issues and whether to use the security framework or not. So I'm not actually disagreeing with you. I'm saying the question goes to the, goes to the heart of, of the dilemma of the field. And by the way, I, yeah, and I didn't want to say that, that nuclear weapons are unimportant. I was just saying it's become about more than, than, than nuclear weapons. Eric? Yes, yeah, so I think it's um, um, Eric. I'm uh, working with the Department of Science and Technology Studies here at the University of Vienna. Um, and, and actually, I need to sort of mention it before, like my question, because it was both going in a very similar direction uh, as the previous one. Um, because also in the field of sort of security studies, particularly critical security studies, there is this argument that um, <coughs> when we talk about health security, it's indeed sort of the, the sort of more common burden of disease that you described that, that should be sort of an area of, of security focus um, rather than the pandemics. And part of that argument is, the que is related to the question about so security for whom is at stake here, right? So and if, it, if you're talking about, particularly global in the South, what sort of, what people in the global South, what the sort of most um, pressing, you know, health security threats for them are, it's not sort of these pandemics that may or may not occur, but it's sort of everyday lives, um, including in many places still a, a large burden of communicable diseases, I think, even though it is no longer the sort of majority, as well as sort of non community um, so related to that, I, I really like sort of the argument where you're ending up, where you're ending up about this sort of molecular ontology and epistemology. On one way, it's also kind of a molecular politics that you can link back, sort of trace back to, um, you know, who are the sort of political institutions involved in the security question, and isn't it sort of also the case that? the particular way of thinking about security, right, which is kind of militaristic, which is kind of about, um, you know, closing the borders from threats coming from elsewhere, 
is sort of more amenable to an understanding of security, health security, in those terms of sort of, you know, the molecular kind of pathogens that are coming from somewhere else and need to be understood and, and fought by not, you know, not sort of a rocket, not a missile system, but a pharmaceutical system. Um, right, so is it, is it that sort of also, really, is it that also why sort of there's a particular tendency to understand um, security issues in, in these sort of molecular terms rather than sort of the maybe more, let's say, phenotypic? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Right. So, so I think they're right. And this, I mean, this is also actually quite interesting in terms of debates about securitization and so forth. But there, there is something about infectious diseases in particular that make that make them discursively more alignable mm -hmm. with security debates than a lot of non-communicable issues. Though, though there are crossovers. Also, you know, like the people talk about, for example, like the obesity. Uh, bomb, time bomb, and like, th there are also actually attempts to you know, the war on cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Susan Sontag has written about this. So, so it, it, it's actually not just infectious disease, but in terms of the field of global health security that I've mapped today, it does tend to be predominantly infectious disease. It's also true that, yes, these infections are not necessarily the, the priority in many low income countries, so when an outbreak happens, many low income countries actually want the same. So, Technology. So what, 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 what you saw, for example, under pandemic flu wasn't, oh, well, we don't want to have pharmaceuticals. They were complaining, actually, we want them too, right? So it, it, it is actually what, you know, what, what different societies want in different contexts is also fluid and, and, and uh, context dependent. Um, I think the last thing I say is that genealogically, the, the, the scientists are not innocent parties in all of this, in the sense that they, they were... The famous ones like Joshua Lederberg, etc., who historically have led scientific communities and who have pushed the kind of emerging and re-emerging infectious disease worldview. So, so it's something that they are actively cultivating. So there is also something here about science and society and how science legitimates uh, uh, itself. Um, but what I've tried to argue today is that it's also absolutely central, both to the threat construction and also to this kind of pharmaceutical countermeasure imaginary that, that is emerging. But I think there's also quite strong evidence actually that that imaginary also extends to low income countries in, a, in an outbreak situation. They often feel extremely vulnerable and upset when they see that these kinds of technologies are available to, to some countries but not, but not to others. And it gives, you know, it gives huge power to the U.S. to, to preside over this enterprise. But it's a power that also comes out of the huge civilian bioeconomy that they have, right? So it's not if they they have the whole civilian industry, and then they have ways of plucking things out to 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 generate these additional capabilities. It's quite different in China. China is also moving into the space, but obviously state society relations are very different in China and that, that allows for, for different models as well. Yeah, all the questions flow into each other today. Um, mine is about the pros and cons of framing health issues as security issues, because obviously there's lots of pros and you walk us through them, you know, creating this high politics understanding and creating attention and money for, for important issues. But securitization theory says there's lots of downsides to that too, and one is depolitization, so things become market-driven, technocratic approaches to social and political issues. And the other one is creating insecurities, actually, and I'm thinking about a study we did here on the, on the Frontex, uh, the uh, European Border and Coast Guard Agency risk analysis, uh, with Julia Saxet and Clemens as well, uh, and they talk about, they link migration issues to the spread of infectious diseases. What they do every year, they tell you, this is not a problem. But they continue to give more and more space within their reports to the issue. So I think that's an example of where they link security and health in a way that actually creates insecurity for vulnerable people and really makes health issues into, if you will, a neo-colonial way of governing migration issues. So where can we draw that line between a useful security frame for health issues and one that's also harmful. 
Great. So, uh, and you know, that was also the first question I remember uh, many moons ago now when HIV AIDS emerged as a security issue. You know, the, I remember reading an article, should HIV AIDS be securitized, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty precise because it's an unspecific issue of, um, of the migration access. So in the global health field, they are not happy about that link at all, right, with, with migration. And, it, and, it, and uh, for them, migration is an important global health issue, but it's, how it's, it's about servicing medical needs and unmet medical needs of, of migrants, who, for whom it could be much more difficult to access health services and for a variety of reasons give the care that they need. So the global health community is, is not pleased about uh, that, that nexus uh, uh, at all. Uh, more generally, um, I think, even if you think about the talk today, right, so immediately, and it kind of goes back to your question earlier, right, but to many of the questions, is once you frame it as a security issue, it, it's, you're already selecting out a particular basket of issues for prioritization over others, right? So, so the framing, and you could frame health issues in many, it could be an economic issue, it could be a human rights issue, it could be many different ways, right? So that just the power of framing as a security is, is already very challenging. And then you have to, in the health field, additional complications because you're dealing with, with, with people's health and what's happening inside their, their bodies, you know, and it, you could get not just kind of a technicalization, but you could also, in, in, in the early years of HIV, there were huge concerns about human rights violations, right? About seeing people living with HIV as a threat to, to other people and all kinds of nasty things that, that happen to people and, and continue in many parts of the world to happen to people living with HIV because many diseases, and not just HIV, are stigmatized and, and so forth. So there, there, there are huge drawbacks, um, though it, it's, you know, I think my thinking on this is that the, 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 the field of health security is maybe less the securitization of health and more actually the governmentalization of security. So what I haven't seen so much is this kind of, this, this um, Schmittian exceptionalism and kind of draconian measures, but actually more a kind of integration of the welfare of the population into security strategies and a whole bunch of stuff that goes around that. And, and that doesn't make it less dangerous, but it makes it differently dangerous. Maybe we collect these questions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tang Chang. I work for NGO, uh, say for World Focusing on China. But what I'm doing in daily has nothing to do with the global health issue at all. Uh, however, I've been working following on um, um, strategic trade controls, where because uh, we are we are uh, running the pro uh, jets, basically uh, um, encouraging like different nations and from, from the government, national government and private sector, business sectors to participate in um, sharing good practices and trying to see uh, if there's a way that uh, a certain uh, type of standards could be held. So for example, for companies that uh, they are uh, following a certain type of uh, compliance or principle of compliance, uh, to be part of this export control society. But what I think is quite interesting in your presentation is also about the involvement of uh, uh, business sectors, where you talk about like reluctance of the big companies uh, participating in this type of rule uh, making uh, discussions. And then you mentioned WADA, the initiative of WADA, where it, and yeah, at the end it turns out to be that they kind of uh, trying to attract those small and medium-sized enterprises to be part of the initiative. I wonder, does it actually reinforce the attitudes uh, of those big companies? I mean, in this part of the community, that our opinions or our practice is not, you know, that relevant in terms of uh, standard making, policy forming. I mean, the big companies. So here we see a different type of pictures where the big companies are reluctant, but small companies do see uh, business opportunities. While for export controls, it's, it, it seems like the big companies are those who are leading uh, the, the, the discussion, saying we need to make standards, we need to uh, come together, set up you know, like uh, practices so that 
uh, within the uh, business community, people speak to each other. So we'll spread the words to the smaller companies. It seems that here is totally different uh, picture. So can you share some of uh, your insights to that? I'm also I'm wondering, um, for the uh, international framework you're talking about, it seems that it's also challenging. The current framework, international framework, uh, have difficulties in catching up those emerging scientific trends, as you, as you illustrated. And also, I wonder here, what is the role of scientific scientists and what is the role of the business sectors in you know, adding, adding uh, their opinion that was because they are on the front line of leading science, uh, I mean scientific development. So I think it's really important to actually count them into uh, this discussion, this debate. So, yeah, that's, that's Maybe we ask. Okay, thank you, Bernard uh, Fuska from the Institute for Advanced Studies in Vienna. Um, you talked about the um, problems and challenges that the uh, dominant framing of um, health issues and pandemics uh, and the related reliance on medical countermeasures, um, what kind of problems this? Uh, this bring, bring about. And I'm wondering, is there any other imaginary re in the relevant communities, security community, uh, medical professionals, scientists, or maybe um, in the countries which do not really buy the securitization of global health in the first place? Is there any alternative imaginary other than the medical countermeasure imaginary in response to? to uh, Should we add another one, or I think it's... Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what time we finish, so it's up to you as the chair. A little bit over cool. time, so okay. maybe we add... It's a very brief one. Yes. It's a very brief one. <laughs> no, because we were, we've been talking about health, and we've been talking about physical health. And this is what I'm, what I'm interested in also, and which is, has been interesting me for, for quite a while. What about mental health in this, in this issue? I mean... It is a prevalent topic, and I know it's not like a pandemic, so I, uh, depress, depression is not infectious, but I mean, it still is a, a, a quite a, It is infectious in our society, maybe. Because, uh, anyway, I mean, particularly in the US as a post war society, there's a lot of the time bomb of, I would say, of a lot of uh, veterans with uh, post traumatic stress disorders. And I was wondering how states account for that in their contingency strategies, because we talk about uh, physical epidemics and so on. But I mean, physical uh, mental health is, is quite an issue. And it is. I'm also wondering, do you think it should be framed as a security issue? Because I mean, PTSD people can be dangerous for us, but particularly for themselves. I mean, this is something that we have to, in my opinion. We have to account for the people who are physically ill, they are particularly dangerous for themselves, which still is danger. So yeah, that's sort of my question. We should expand this to mental health as well. Mm -hmm. kind of range of topics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. And I'll try if, if we are over time then I'll try to I'll try to can we, can uh, take some okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all your questions about the the, the the business. How to motivate yeah. business? Yes. So, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's been the, the key U.S. question for the past many years. Is, is they, they're trying to figure out how can they motivate business, right? which is not what we thought we would find when, when we started the project, right? And but it's it is you're right in what you're saying. So what what they have learned is that big pharma is is not interested because the, the sums are just not big enough, but that they can form relations with small companies which is kind of where the innovation tends to occur. But when they then partnered with small companies, the, there were some quite spectacular failures early on because these small companies had no experience and didn't have the skills to actually take this product all the way up through regulatory approval and so forth, and so then the money was, was kind of lost. And so part of the medical countermeasure enterprise has been the US government feeling its way through you know, how to plug these gaps. And BARDA is, is, is part of that, where they kind of then try to work with those small companies because they don't have anybody else to work with and to try to give them the necessary skills to see these products through. 
Um, there's also a really interesting question about standards. So for kind of normal health issues, for sure, big business is always pushing for standardization and they want to have regulatory harmonization, you know, because right now they have to do clinical trials in many different countries to, sh to show to in each market, you know, that it's safe. And so, so if there was like one universal standard for them, that would just be so wonderful, right? It would make their life a, a, a lot easier. But standards are actually also really important um, in the medical countermeasure field because uh, it's actually really complicated just to move medical countermeasures from one country to another country, from country A to country B, because there are, you know, there are technical requirements about humidity, temperature, etc. that have to be guaranteed, but it's also about all the regulatory stuff that, that has to happen. And so people are also looking at how can that be, so basically regulatory, legal, technical barriers to actually moving medical countermeasures between two countries. And so there's a lot of stuff that has to be kind of worked out and figure out how that can be made simpler. So the standards are slightly different from your question, but the, but the standards are still absolutely uh, key there. Are there any non-medical countermeasure imaginaries? Um, I think there is one. Um, I think there's two. So I think there's, I think there's, the first one is health systems, right? And so which is actually to say, when you look at all these challenges, this is, you know, we're still so far away from being able to really generate medical countermeasures that ultimately the only thing, the best protection is still going to be from, from basic and well-functioning function, health systems. And so that's, I think, the kind of social medicine, not the, not the pharmaceutical, but the social medicine is the big <coughs> thing, and there are huge efforts now going on at WHO to actually link the global health security agenda with the health systems agenda. Mm -hmm. The second imaginary, though, that uh, I'm also quite interested in is, uh, is like a hyper pharmaceutical, rather than a, a counter, it's a hyper pharmaceutical. That, that goes back to some of the things I was talking about, the data, right? So in, in the flu field, just to give you one example, in the flu field, the US government, Florida, they now have a, for a pre-pandemic vaccine, they kind of have a universal backbone of a vaccine. So when a new flu virus emerges with pandemic potential, and you know how the flu virus always H5N1 is always the H and the N. If they can get the sequence data from the H and the N, from the hemagglutinin and from the neuraminidase, they can chemically synthesize those proteins just off the back of the sequence data and then plug it into their vaccine. Which means they're already in the influenza field, but the early, so early stages, you know, but we're getting to a point where you can begin to make medical countermeasures without needing actual biological materials and specimens, just with the sequence data. And so the, the new imaginer, the hyper imaginer, <coughs> is like a informationalized pharmaceuticalization, where you, you're pharmaceuticalizing, but, but they, they, they talk about the singularity or about a, a global digital immune system, where they want all this data kind of flowing up into a centralized location in, 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 in real time. It's a real, it's, it's an imaginary, but, it, but it, Politically significant, uh, and that mental health. You know, mental health is. Uh, I'm not going to say should or shouldn't. It, you know, that that would be an article. But what I will say is, what is quite interesting to me about about mental health is that actually it's one that has, in a fairly short amount of time, gathered a lot of political momentum and attention, without being securitized. Right. So people always say we have to securitize to get this political momentum. Right. But I see mental health getting a lot of high-level high, high level political declaration, a lot of media attention, a lot of research funding, both for, for, for medical, but also for social science projects, all around mental health, right? And everybody's talking about it as a, as a crisis in, in a broad sense, right? But it's not being overtly securitized in the way that, so that's, you know, I think that's really interesting, and, and I can't give you the answer, but I can say that would be another that would be a great research project, right? And understand how, how did they get all, something that was completely marginalized in such a short time, get that level of polit political priority without having to be secured at. Mm -hmm. But there's of course also a pharmaceutical, the, 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 the powerful pharmaceutical dimension in mental health. 
There's even more regulatory <laughs> because if you think of, I don't know, LSD was used to treat, um, yes. to treat, uh, I think it was PTSD, uh, yes. and then it was yes. forbidden. So I mean, that would be a question: Why did this happen actually? Why is it still? Why is it now considered a dangerous illegal drug yes. instead of a medication? And there are also other things to secure, you know, like for obviously conflict, not just for combatants, but also for non-combatants, yes. produces a lot of trauma and as well. Is there any one pressing one question, the very last question? And thank you so much. It was uh, gives us a lot of thought and things to think through. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming. And for your questions.